This object for us is an armrest, normally placed in our permanent Chinese exhibition in the National Museum of Ethnology in Leiden. Today we're in the reserve collection where we're discussing it. It's an ivory object. It may be as much as 400 years old, possibly 300, or certainly at least 200. Whoever made this object uh, wanted to create something that would suggest strongly that it was 400 years old, that it came from one of the great southern cities of China like Suzhou or Nanjing, and that it was an object dating to the late Ming Dynasty, that's the early 17th century. Ivory is a material that's been recovered from archaeological sites in China dating to the Neolithic. We have sites where objects made in ivory have been recovered that date to some 5,000 years old. Elephants once roamed China until within historical times they were gradually pushed towards the southwest and then became extinct. After that, the larger supply of ivory to China was in the hands of Arab merchants working both sides of the Indian Ocean and later a substantial amount of ivory was brought to China by Spanish and Portuguese merchants who themselves commissioned objects in ivory to take back to Europe. Ivory is a very strong material, a very dense material that is perfect for carving. We can tell ivory from other sorts of bones by its very close structure, its grain, in the sense of a wood grain, but that appears as a kind of checkerboard pattern, lozenge-shaped squares very close to each other, and are difficult to see with the naked eye. This object shows relief carving on both sides. It's a uh, an example of what we call in Chinese um, yang ke, or yang carving, yang from the expression yin and yang, where the yang sense is um, provided by its uh, relief or semi-relief, or it's these elements that stand proud of a flatter surface. Ivory is carved usually with the same tools that carvers use for other materials, principally jade, bamboo, wood. It's interesting that in the history of carving in China, ivory isn't always specified among the records that tell us about this art. In fact, it's obvious that some carvers who dealt with bamboo or wood also dealt sometimes with ivory. But we have very little specific history about ivory carving. Ivory was popular with the elite, uh, although it was only one material among others. For example, bamboo was sometimes uh, more favoured, principally because many collectors wrote about bamboo and other collectors and historians wrote about jade. This is because bamboo has associations of plainness, uh, which translate into aesthetic or moral qualities of something that is unadorned, something that is perhaps more honest. Jade has the association of antiquity, since jade is recorded very, very early in Chinese history and is therefore linked with founding moments of Chinese civilization. This object, if it is indeed 400 years old, or even if it is not, uh, was closely associated in late Ming, early 17th century, views on ivory with quite negative views. Sometimes ivory was seen as a property of the nouveau riche, a, an object that featured in rather flash lifestyles. We read this in books about antiques, guides to lifestyle, and in fictional accounts, novels, short stories that show us ivory, usually in the hands of rather reprehensible individuals. That attitude would gradually change. During the 18th century, ivory becomes much more broadly circulated and some of its visual references become the common currency of painting, books and so on. This object clearly belonged to rich owners. Uh, we see on one side of it uh, garden scene. Gardens belonged to the wealthy, people who owned land, people who commissioned landscape artists. And on the other side we see the popular pastime of kite flying. It's possible that this object wasn't functional. It may have been made as a decorative object that refers to functionality but that wasn't actually used because its superior craftsmanship, the expense of the material, risked the dangers of dropping the object or indeed spilling ink on it. Objects without functions have interesting art histories in China. We think of, for example, our fans that might be painted and placed into the pages of an album. 
That's to say that a famous artist might paint a fan with no intention of letting anybody or expecting anybody to use it to keep cool. A modern, obvious equivalent would be stamps that are issued by the post office with no intention of their users to lick them and stick them on envelopes. Nevertheless, this object suggests by its shape, by some of its formal properties, bamboo. We see this on this curved edge down here, or indeed on these elements here on the underside. Its plain surface, however, refers to other arts, most especially to painting. We see this line here, which is the only incision on the object. Everything else is done in relief. Of course, uh, references the joy of painting or drawing with ink. It also refers, of course, to book publishing. In the late Ming, in the 17th century, to which this object tries to refer, book publishing had reached one of its heights, and this included illustrated books in which the illustrations might include empty spaces that were not inked. This emptiness, of course, helped contrast with the printed areas, but it also suggested a lavishness, a luxuriousness of waste in which there's no economy compelling the illustrator to use every square inch of the page or to use up all the publisher's supply of paper. And these references are made very clear again in this object. This empty air behind the kite string and the kite is also a space which could have been inscribed and yet it hasn't been. There are other examples of book of armrests uh, available in museum collections. A interesting comparison is one in the Cleveland Museum in the United States which has been engraved with word, Chinese characters, words, a short inscription that tries to suggest through references that it was once owned by one of the most famous art collectors of the Ming Dynasty. That reference in itself gives a suggestion all too uh, difficult to ignore that the object was probably a fake created for an unwary buyer of a later period. The fact that the Leiden armrest isn't inscribed and doesn't even have the name of a maker on it is paradoxically enough quite a good suggestion that it may be the real thing. It might be quite an old ivory object. This is a modest creation, one that superbly, however, condenses technical skill with cultural history. Its beauty, of course, is its visual wit in using the space available um, and, of course, its intricate detail. This is an object, a work of art, that perhaps combines artistry with artisanship and yet, on the other hand, perhaps is the strongest evidence available that the division between artist and artisan is a false one. After all, many great carvers in Chinese history were people who achieved the status of artists. It's of course wholly appropriate that an object like this is in an ethnological museum where it's not only significant as a work of art, but as an object that can help us interpret the society that produced it.